Morgen von meiner Seite. Ähm, genau, ich spreche heute, ach, das war zu schnell. Ich möchte heute über äh, Single-Page-Application sprechen, ähm, so I switch zu Englisch, because I think it was uh, announced in English. So, so um, I'm speaking about Single-Page-Applications uh, and uh, what security risks are uh, considered uh, with Single-Page-Applications. So this is the main topic. Um, let me shortly introduce myself. Uh, My name is Andreas Falk. I'm working for a company called Novatec Consulting, located in the south of Germany, in Stuttgart. Um, so I'm doing a usual IT consultancy uh, for, for big customers of, of banking insurance, uh, for example. Um, and apart from that, I'm very keen on application security topics and also identity management. Um, that's why I'm also a member of the, the Open Web Application Security Project and also the Open ID Foundation. So if you want to reach me, you can reach me via Twitter or just directly write me an email if you have questions after the session or anything else. So let's dive in uh, into our topic. So we are talking about browser-based applications or single page applications as it is called as of today. Um, so this nowadays is the most popular client type. So, so in the past, we often developed uh, server-side uh, web applications like, like Vardin, like Spring MVC with Timeleaf, or, or Java server faces was very prominent. Uh, but nowadays, it, 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 it went more and more into the, the client side uh, where we are running JavaScript-based uh, web UIs directly in the browser of the end user. And this brings me to the next point. So, so from a security perspective, this as well is the most problematic client type you can have because it, it runs totally on the control of the user. Um, you as a developer, architect, uh, operator, you have no control over the application anymore because it, it just runs on the end user side in, in their own web browser. And, and this is typically installed by the end user. The end user installs some browser plugins that also may have malicious code inside, may be broken. Um, the browser also cannot hide any secrets. Uh, so if you open up the, the developer tools, then if you have put a password uh, or any other secret in the JavaScript code, uh, anybody could just uh, see that uh, secret in just seconds. And as well, there is no really secure browser storage. Um, we will see it later how you can really read all the browser storage just by one uh, cross-site scripting leak. Uh, I have a short demo on that. Um, so, so always be, be cautious what to put in the browser storage um, um, because it can be just stolen by some cross-site scripting uh, problem. And here we talk about the typical frameworks like React.js, Vue.js, Angular, um, and also the, the, the JavaScript language or the, the TypeScript language that is then transpiled into JavaScript as well. So we have also the OVAS top 10, and, and this is uh, the, the topic of today is, is somehow structured uh, around the OVAS top 10 um, with special risks for the single page application. Um, so, so number one is the broken access control. And here we talk about cross-site uh, uh, cross scripting request forgery problems, uh, the cross origin uh, problems, or, or just the basic authorization problems. So the typical thing that you, for example, have a, a, a basket in your shop and, and you have a basket ID and just by, by guessing some other ID, you can access uh, the basket of some other users. So this is a typical authorization problem um, that most shops, uh, of course, luckily don't have anymore as of today. 
And number two is cryptographic failures. So this is more like a backend thing. You have also web crypto available in the browser, but usually most of the cryptographic stuff is happening on the server side. So we don't talk about that today. What we have a really big focus on will be cross-site scripting because that is the main uh, danger of, of uh, having inside uh, your single page applications. Then my, my most favorite new topic in the OWASP Top 10 as of 2021 edition is the new insecure design. Um, because lots of uh, security related mistakes uh, actually don't happen uh, during coding. They already happen uh, during design architecture and stuff. You, you select some, some nasty exotic frameworks. You, you don't build your your components uh, in a in a in a good way. You don't use clean code stuff and and and, and all that uh, topics. So that's why lots of mistakes, also security wise, happen in, in such early phases. And with insecure design, it is propagated um, to to look into your architecture, do some threat modeling uh, as well. So, so look for for typical threats that could happen in your architecture, and also perform security unit tests, um, unit tests as well on the client and on the server side. Uh, security misconfiguration, we will not talk much about that one. So, so that could also be in the same direction like, like cross-origin uh, resource sharing problems, the typical wildcard uh, problem that you put a wildcard on the server side and so that every uh, client could just uh, send HX requests again to your endpoint because you opened up all the cross-origin uh, stuff here. Then vulnerable and outdated components. This is about dependencies. Um, this can be done by the NPM tool, for example. We will also have a bit later on that. One part is also the identification and authentication failures. Here we typically talk nowadays about OAuth 2.0 or OpenID Connect with JSON Web Tokens. So this is the state of the art authentication we use. Uh, also together with uh, our single page applications. Then software data integrity failures. Uh, we also don't talk about that today. So, so here we'll find uh, also some, some deserialization uh, stuff, for example, that also usually happens on the server side. Um, number nine is, is typically also seen as a server side thing, uh, the, the logging and monitoring, but uh, especially for, for the problems that could happen on the client side and also some part, uh, some mechanisms that can defend against that, like content security policies, for example, you should also have a client side blocking. I will show also a bit of that later. And the last point, server side request forgery, the name already tells, so we don't talk about that because that's not a client side thing. So broken access control. Um, so for those of you who don't already know what a cross site request uh, forgery uh, problem is, um, I have a, a short uh, scheme here shown on the screen. Um, you have the, the business client application. That's the intended application on the client side that you have built. And, but you also have so the attacker side. So some attacker just put up a form of nice cat pictures um, because that attacker made some social engineering, for example, and, and did recognize that lots of employees of that company that built that business client application maybe likes cats and maybe get to that form of cat pictures. And now they, they use some, some trick uh, around uh, session-based authentication. So, so if you don't have a stateless authentication with tokens, you might as well have the, the, the more old-fashioned uh, authentication using uh, form-based login with session cookies. Um, and the session cookies, are typically automatically sent by your web browser if you access the same domain again. And this fact is now used by the attacker. So, so behind the scenes, you have a cat picture that 
then also uh, is hidden uh, from you uh, with a second picture and behind the scenes, it just also calls your REST API like you see at the bottom, API customers that then creates uh, some new customer, for example. So you, on the left side, you will have the intended thing with the customer form to create some customer. But if you then click on some cat picture, it might happen behind the scenes that because you have the session cookie sent together with the request, that it also calls the REST API and your server cannot uh, distinguish between the valid call of the business client application and the attacker client application. And to defend against this, you, you will need basically an additional a token uh, that is sent together with uh, the REST API request. Uh, so that it is not possible anymore to statically just put some, some request in a, in a form behind the picture. Uh, that will not work again because of a missing dynamic token that is also put as part of the request. Um, and you typically have the synchronizer token pattern that is used for the more old fashioned uh, web applications like Java server faces and stuff like that. Um, for the single page applications, you typically use a mechanism called double submit cookie. And you can also use same site cookie attributes uh, set to your session uh, cookies, and that also can prevent that same kind of attack. Um, Depending on the, the security uh, level you need for your application, you might also add additional defenses like re-authentication. So a typical banking application does some re-authentication. You have to put first your, your PIN code. And then if you want to transfer money, you have a re-authentication part where you put a, a TAN number um, that is needed to actually transfer the money. So captures are not really recommended as additional defense because they have a horrible uh, user experience usually. Um, and uh, number one advice here is you should not abuse get requests to modify resources. So don't use get requests to, to uh, transfer money, for example. So that would be a bad idea because most of the frameworks that have built in uh, token-based mitigations for CSRF already uh, don't have these kind of defenses in place for GET requests. So typically GET requests are not protected by the CSRF defense. So this is only put inside for, for post puts, deletes, so that modifying requests. So that's why be careful with GET requests. So this is the double submit cookie that is used in all the single page applications usually. Um, so that works that, that the server side uh, sets some special cookie with some, some token value inside. And the single page application just reads that same uh, cookie and sets a custom HTTP header with the next request. And then the server side just compares these two values. And if they are matching, then the request is valid. Um, so you have built-in defenses in, in the framework Angular. Um, Angular supports the double submit cookie. So if Angular detects the, the cookie set by the server side, it automatically adds the corresponding uh, header value to the requests. Um, that is a, a great thing. So, so you don't need any other framework, any other thing. It's, if it detects the cookie, then it automatically adds the required stuff. Um, with React and Vue.js, uh, you don't have that default CSRF protection because these two uh, frameworks are not full-blown uh, framework as of Angular. They don't have uh, support for, for calling REST APIs by default. So usually you use frameworks like Axios. And luckily, Axios also has support for double submit cookies. So if you bring Axios, as a uh, library to your React Vue.js application, then you can also enable uh, CSRF defense here as well. So for authorization, um, this is quite simple. Um, authentication authorization must always be implemented on the server side. 
So if you just implement hiding UI elements on some kind of roles on the client side, this is what we call security by obscurity. Um, and if an attacker detects that mechanism, uh, that the attacker can just re-enable or re uh, or make, make the elements visible again on the browser side with just uh, changing your JavaScript or your HTML code uh, in runtime. So that's an easy task. You also have attacker tools that does do that automatically by just enabling some button in OVASAP, for example. You can uh, make uh, hidden elements visible or uh, disabled elements enabled automatically in just uh, seconds. So that's no protection. So never try to, to uh, put only authorization authentication on the client side. So the main authorization authentication must always happen on the server side. Um, for usability things, you can still hide or uh, disable elements on the UI, but uh, don't uh, put your complete authorization mechanism on that. So now the, the main part will be cross-site scripting because that's the number one uh, risk for single page applications. Um, so this is the number one, as mentioned already, uh, security issue. And, and this deals with, with executing malicious scripts in the user's browsers. Um, you can have different attacks using cross-site scripting. Uh, you can steal token session IDs that can be sent to an attacker site. I will have a short demo just in a moment. Uh, you can even put scripts like key lockers uh, on, on, on your the browser. Uh, so that it can also then attack some other uh, websites. Like if you then put in your PIN, TAN numbers for, for your banking application, then if you have a keylogger installed, then this uh, TAN PIN numbers can also be sent to some attacker browser, uh, attacker server. There are even sophisticated tools available for attackers called like the beef tool. Um, uh, that can inject rootkits into a browser and then the browser will be totally controllable by the attacker. The attacker could just sneak in nasty scripts uh, and, and execute uh, different things on your browser. So how does cross-site scripting happen? So, so typically you have some user input that is given to your single page application via the web browser. Uh, that might end up on the server side as well. Um, but the dangerous thing here is that you have the user input uh, that is coming into your JavaScript application. Um, then it goes into some, some dangerous things potentially like the inner HTML uh, uh, command. Um, this is then uh, uh, pass through the HTML parser. So this is not the dangerous part, but then if you have JavaScript code anywhere inside that, uh, that parts here, like, like in the inner HTML thing, uh, then the JavaScript engine of the web browser automatically picks up that JavaScript code. That engine does not care if it's malicious code or valid code, it just executes every code it finds uh, uh, inside that uh, inner HTML command. And then here would happen malicious code execution, like sending tokens to attacker websites and stuff like that, or the famous alert uh, box that you always uh, use as a proof of a uh, cross-site scripting problem. And this is the, the typical mechanism how cross-site scripting happens. And you have three different types of cross-site scripting. Uh, so this is the most common one uh, that most people know about. So this is the reflected cross-site scripting. Uh, you have some user input that is directly uh, evaluated uh, by, your, uh, by your application. Um, this input uh, then also goes to your server application that then directly reflects that input in a response. That response is then also evaluated in your web browser and, and put out, and you have cross-site scripting happening here. So that's 
that's the thing that must be handled on client and server side. Uh, you can, for example, put uh, input validation on the server side and also strong typing on the server side. So for example, if you have some parameter passed in as a user input that is a number, then please don't use uh, generic strings on the server side. Then also use strong typing and restrict it really to the integer or type on the server application. Then uh, the, the attacks uh, of, of reflecting input stuff will not happen that way because you also re return an, a number again, um, and then, then there is no, no string possible. So the second thing is the persistent cross-site scripting that's even more dangerous because then the, the payload of the cross-site scripting attack is stored in the database and every user that calls that uh, record from the database will get the cross-site scripting attack. So this also must be handled on client and server side. Uh, the addition here is that you should also handle uh, input validation on the data access layer as well. So if you use JPA, for example, with entity beans, then you should also uh, put some, some validation on that layer as well. So the third and last uh, type, uh, especially famous with the single page application stuff, is the DOM-based cross-site scripting. Uh, this, this works completely only on the client side. Uh, you never will see that attack on the server side. It just happens inside your JavaScript application. You will not, not find any logs on your server side. And this also then has to be handled completely on the client side. So before jumping into here, I have some short demo prepared. So let me just show that. Uh, let me check. So I have some, some JavaScript here um, that just has some, some data as shown here with some attack payload, like, like uh, creating some, some image here. Um, as you can see here, uh, I will put some image source here. And, and with the image source, I base, uh, do a base64 encoding of all the values I read from the local storage. And then I also put that image as a, a child into my DOM. Uh, and, and this is the, the, the mechanism of the attack, basically. So I've also prepared some, some attacker application already. So this is the attacker application running on port 8080 on, on here. You can see that's just a really simple Spring Boot application that reads in the, the, the value here. Uh, decodes that value from the base64 uh, encoding and then just puts out uh, puts out uh, the, the decoded value here uh, so we will see that on the console then if the attack is uh, successful so I just close that one so this is the the, the demo for that I put in some values here in my local storage uh, to prove that some some access token some some basket id for example or some some completely other value as some examples and if you are now i try to 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 uh, to, to do that attack i you don't see anything happening here just put, it puts some some additional image on that side um, but if you see on the server side now we have send all the decoded store values, as you can see here, to our attacker side. And this is what we call cross-site scripting typically. So, so you can just put some payload in an input field, for example, and this is executed by the, the browser. And then you can send all the values of your local storage, for example, to some attacker website. And then if you have an access token here, for example, then the attacker can use that to attack your uh, servers that are then authenticated with that same access token. So that was the short demo about that. So you can see how that really works. And luckily there are also some defense mechanisms for cross-site scripting. Uh, 
so especially for the, the single page applications, you have stuff like templates, like server side rendering uh, mechanisms. And here, uh, one recommendation is do not put untrusted data into the templates or server side rendering. So, so it's a bad idea to, to render your templates or server side rendering by using also user input. So sh should never do that because then you have not your trusted uh, static templates or server-side rendering anymore. Then always use strict input validations from typing on the server-side. And then the main focus, because cross-site scripting really happens on the client side, uh, are mechanisms like contextual output encoding, sanitizing, putting content security policies in place. Um, also a quite new mechanism called trusted types. I will also have a special section in just, uh, some minutes for that. And you can also protect your session cookie um, by using the HTTP only flag uh, so that the session cookie also cannot be stolen uh, quite easily by some cross-site stripping attack. Because with HTTP only flag, no JavaScript application will read uh, that session cookie anymore. So contextual output encoding is the number one defense against cross-site scripting, because usually if you build some single page application, uh, you typically don't uh, build uh, what we call, for example, a rich text editor, where you want to really encode uh, the values again as HTML. So, so you don't want to, to put that out as, as bold or, or, or blinking. Uh, textual representations, you just put typically textual representations out. So, so you just want to print out some, some value as a text value on your HTML page. And this is why the output encoding is a really good defense against cross-site scripting here. It just re-encodes all the dangerous parts like, 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 the, like the, the, uh, the opening or closing uh, brackets here, like, like the scripts ones uh, into what we call HTML and entity encodings. Like you can see on the bottom with the ampersand encoded stuff. And um, this will not ever be evaluated by the JavaScript engine anymore. It just will put out that as a textual representation. And this then is completely in dangerous. Uh, so no cross-site scripting is happening here anymore. Um, but uh, the difficulty here is that you might have different uh, variants of this output encoding depending on the context you have to encode the stuff. Like in the HTML entities, attributes you use a bit different uh, approach, like in the JavaScript context or in the CSS context, or for using URL encodings. So that's why you should never try to implement that output encoding yourself. Um, usually you stick to the output encoding that's, that is built inside your frameworks as well. So, so luckily in, in most of the frameworks of today, uh, this is built in automatically. What is not built uh, inside lots of frameworks automatically is what we call sanitization. Um, this is needed if you really want to render your input value as well as uh, HTML interpreted uh, thing, like, like you want to put out bold text or blinking text again. Um, this is quite dangerous because then it will again execute all the JavaScript parts as well, as you can see on the on arrow part above here with the alert one. And in the sanitizer now does one thing, it just deletes all the dangerous parts of the HTML part. So it still renders it as a bold text, but without the dangerous JavaScript part with the on error part. So that is just deleted, uh, removed from that, uh, that uh, snippet here. And you can use libraries and APIs for that, like the Purify is the most recommended one that puts a then sanitizer here. For URLs, there's also a special library available to sanitize URL. And also the browser uh, manufacturers currently try to build a native API into the browsers called the HTML sanitizer API. But as this is quite experimental, so I would not recommend to use that uh, as of now. Um, 
Busted types is also a really recommended uh, mechanism to defend against uh, cross-site scripting, especially the DOM cross-site scripting here. Um, and this is a quite interesting mechanism because in, uh, instead of the other uh, mechanisms that uh, try to, to just do some encoding stuff, um, this typically uh, defends the cross-site scripting at the really sync. Uh, so, so it defends that when trying to use the inner HTML function, for example, or other native uh, DOM functions that could be dangerous for executing JavaScript. So it locks down the risky sync functions like inner HTML. Uh, so it's not possible that you just use simple string values to, to uh, associate these to the inner HTML function. So instead it rec requires uh, trusted typing. So really, trusted types, uh, there are HTML trusted type, uh, uh, JavaScript trusted types, so, so typed uh, uh, values that you have to use uh, to still associate these to the inner HTML. So if you uh, add this simple header content security policy with the required trusted types for and the, the value script, then you enable the trusted types uh, mode in the web browser, and then it's not possible to, to just associate simple strings uh, to dangerous things anymore. Um, the, the unlucky part is that trusted types currently is only supported by, by Chrome-based uh, browsers and Opera, uh, like Edge, Chrome, Opera, and Safari, Firefox, or the old Internet Explorer that you should not use as of today anymore. Uh, don't uh, support that. Uh, it's not currently planned to add support here. Uh, here you would have to use a polyfill that is available for these unsupported browsers. And I also have some short demo for that part here. Um, again, we have our uh, same attack happening here. Um, and I just enable now the uh, trusted types part. So can you mute your mic? So I will try to, to execute the, the same uh, attack here and um, we'll also switch to the local console to see if the attack really happens again so, so we can also uh, delete the console if you so that we can see if the attack uh, will still happen here. Um, and now we will see that, that the attack does not happen anymore. So, so there is no payload sent to the server anymore. Um, uh, the, only by, by enabling the trusted uh, types uh, mode, as you can see here, it fails to, to set the inner HTML property now. Uh, this requires a trusted HTML assignment. So you cannot use simple strings anymore together with the inner HTML here. Um, but it also does not render image anymore. So it just it does not work anymore. So that feature. If you want also to, to enable that uh, feature from to work again, um, then what you also need is to put some uh, some policy uh, for using uh, trusted types here. Luckily, you can also uh, create a, a default policy for all the uh, inner HTML things, for example. Um, here, I also use the profi because the profi also has native support for trusted types already. Uh, to enable trusted types with the profi, you just enable return trusted types to true, and then it returns the corresponding trusted type that is needed to associate this then to the inner HTML as we have uh, here. We can uh, instead also sanitize that manually, but it is recommended to use trusted types because with that policy in place and with that header here, it just handles all the inner HTML locations you have in your code. So let's reload that again. And try to execute. So, so now we still get the, the, the invalid JPEG that is not found, but 
it now renders again the image here, as you can see, but still not sending any dangerous payload to the server side. So this is how trusted types basically works. Um, as we've seen, uh, it's just enabled by some header here, and then you need to add some, some policy uh, to handle and sanitize uh, all the input values you get uh, with that policy. And for example, for the inner HTML, you would create that great HTML part, and you basically are done. And you have no cross-site scripting for inner HTML uh, anywhere here in your code. So let me switch back to the presentation. So for, for defending against cross-site scripting, luckily uh, in Angular, you have built in inside all the important features out of the box. So that's why I always tell that Angular nowadays is the most secure single page application framework you can have comparing to the other uh, possible frameworks because it has the output encoding directly in place. It has a sanitizer already in place for HTML, URLs, all the uh, nasty stuff. And it also already has built in support for trusted types. So if you put that header uh, inside your application and with the addition of trusted types Angular, then also Angular switches to the trusted types and internally always uses trusted types for inner HTML stuff like, uh, for example, yeah, as well. So that's also a good thing you can read about that in the documentation, which is quite good in Angular for all the security related stuff. So for React Vue.js, the picture changes a bit. Um, so for that, you have the, the, only the contextual output encoding in place, uh, but sanitizing is not done automatically. So this requires Dom Purify as an additional sanitizer. And uh, yeah, you can also enable then uh, trusted types here, but then you have to, to do that also with Dom Purify. So there is no built-in mechanism automatically here. Um, also, avoid unsafe APIs. So you always can trick around the basic framework mechanisms also in, in Angular. You can still make uh, dangerous uh, code snippets here by using element ref to directly access the DOM. Uh, you, you should also not deactivate sanitation uh, with the DOM sanitizer. Uh, with React, you should be careful with using the dangerously set inner HTML. So that is named because it is dangerous actually, because it has no sanitization in place automatically. Um, if you want to use that dangerously set inner HTML, always use it together with uh, DOM profile as a sanitizer. Also avoid direct DOM access as well. And in UJS, it's the same picture. Uh, you should also be careful with the inner HTML calls. And there's also support in uh, what we call that static application security testing tools. Uh, here you can see an example where I used a SEMGREP uh, tool uh, for checking my single page applications. You can have, uh, as you can see here, it, it just puts out that usage of, of unsafe uh, locations in my application, also for the React part, uh, by just performing your static application security testing. Uh, you can also see parts uh, that are might be dangerous in your single page application. And then in security code reviews, if you uh, just see usages of these dangerous things, then you always have to discuss that with your developer, why this actually has been used on that code location. So I have also some quick demo on uh, Angular in place. Uh, let me just switch to the, no, that was the wrong one, the Angular playground. Uh, here I have a, a secure component in place uh, with, with some, some uh, snippets that could be dangerous and I have an insecure uh, thing in place. Um, with, with some, some native element, which you should not do as mentioned. So this is the, the native uh, DOM uh, 
performance here, uh, which I use. And I also have some, some templates in place with the typical uh, inner HTML or, or the textual output mechanism used in Angular. Um, let's see how that works. Um, so this is the, the, the secure uh, thing as, that you see here. And as you can see here, it, it sanitized some unsafe URL here with the JavaScript alert. It stripped some unsafe uh, content automatically from HTML. Um, so you get an error with, with the URL context here. Uh, so, so you won't see any uh, cross-site scripting happening here. If you switch to the insecure page, then you see the famous pop-up hello XSS here several times um, because here there is uh, the, the, the sanitizer is, is uh, switched off here partly and also I'm using the dangerous DOM uh, access directly. Uh, so you can still make mistakes by using Angular if you trick around the uh, uh, protections here. So I will uh, quickly jump over that part. Uh, this is an easy thing to do. So third party dependencies, if you have vulnerabilities here, just use the NPM audit fix tool, uh, update your Angular framework to the latest versions, uh, fixes usually lots of that nasty things or your React.js uh, version. So upgrading to the latest uh, versions is always a good idea with the single page application frameworks. Um, identification or indication I mentioned here that we have the, the uh, OAuth OpenID Connect based authentication usually in place as of today. And even here, you can also make mistakes. So this is the, the, the standard flow you use usually. Um, um, I have to mention uh, here, there is also what is called the implicit flow. Uh, that is a variant of the OAuth uh, protocol flow, uh, don't use the implicit flow anymore. This is insecure. Always use the authorization code flow with the proof key for code exchange addition, as you can see here. Um, that calls the authorization server. You log in inside the authorization server with a login form. Then you get back uh, what we call a, a JSON web token as an access token. And then you transmit that as a viewer JSON web token to the resource server, to your backend, your REST API and you're authenticated here. The dangerous part here is that you have to store these viewer JSON web tokens on the client side. And as we have seen here uh, before with some cross-site scripting, you basically can just transmit all your local storage tokens to some attacker website. That's why this is uh, some script I've put in here. That's why uh, the OAuth, uh, uh, People also recommend using uh, some backend for frontend approach, uh, where you then stick again to cookies on your single page application with the same site uh, HTTP only flex uh, to be safe from cross site request forgery attacks. And then the backend for frontend then deals with the complete token stuff. So it never, it never transmits a token back uh, to the single page application. So this is the most recommended approach nowadays uh, to, to free the browser from any tokens. So last points, uh, server-side logging uh, that you already using in your project should be uh, also fulfilled uh, with the client-side uh, logging. Um, for example, there are two uh, tools I can also recommend. I, I don't get money from that tool, so it just I use that uh, perhaps myself. So, so the reboturai.com, for example, uh, poly, uh, yeah, does some, some reporting on content security policy uh, problems. And sentry.io then can also tell you about unsafe things happening on the client side. So as a summary, so uh, web browsers are not really trustworthy. You have attacks uh, happening like cross-site scripting, cross-site request forgery and stuff like that. So these are widespread. Uh, there are lots of attacks possible on the browser add-ons as well. Don't store sensitive data in your local storage. Uh, also collect relevant stuff on um, uh, your logs here. 
And uh, always use framework lib specific uh, stuff in Angular, consult your documentation, avoid insecure API calls. Also a good source is always to check the OWASP cheat sheets, uh, also conduct code reviews, uh, do tests and look all the provided reference. I will provide uh, the, 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 the slides as well and, and look at the demos here. So that's all what I had here. So, so if there are any questions, you can just ask them now in the remaining four minutes, I think. So I have one question, uh, would it be better to just run web application server side instead of using client side scripting, especially for high risk applications like, like healthcare solutions? Yeah, that's a good point. So, so, so you still can use server side web applications. You still have great support for Spring MVC with Timely, for example, is a great server side web application framework. So if you have high risk applications, then it still is a good variant to use the server side web applications or, or use that uh, the, the approach I showed uh, with OAuth or Mighty Connect with backend for front end so you don't have any tokens on the client side anymore because that's the number one attack uh, to steal tokens from the, the web browser. So any other questions? So, so if there are no questions, so, so you can always also write me an email on Twitter afterwards. So, so if I have shared this slide, you can always get back to me again and ask questions. So, so always be careful using single page applications. Yeah. Um, the BFF thing, so, so was was question. So just uh, switch back to the slide. Um, so lastly, the, the BFF, uh, you, you have the, the complete control of the O outflow happening from the backend for front end. So this deals with all the tokens. It stores the tokens as well. It has some mapping between cookies and, and the tokens. Um, so if there's a cookie sent, it, it gets the token from the storage, for example, and then adds it to all the requests to the backend. So you are here you have the token based approach and to the front end, you have just a mapping between the cookie and uh, the, the tokens from here. So, so the logging works as, as before. So it just redirects to the authorization server from the SPA, but then all the, the it sends the, the authorization code and, and then also the, the token to the backend for front end. So that's, yeah. So I think I will share the, the, the link to the, the slides uh, to the, to the uh, session. Planner, I think. So hopefully that has answered uh, the, the BFF question. I also always have to put the windows aside. And that's all from my side, what I had today. So thank you very much and I hope you have a wonderful uh, JCon conference and uh, with some other interesting talks afterwards.